Um, as Leslie said, my name is Marcia Good, and I currently serve as the senior advisor for the administrator, Liz Ryan, who is the administrator of the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention within uh, the Department of Justice. I've served for a number of years as senior counsel to the director of the Office of Tribal Justice, also known as OTJ, uh, within DOJ. And prior to that, I was an, an AUSA, an assistant U.S. attorney, uh, prosecuting cases in Indian country and child exploitation cases in the District of Montana. Um, I've worked for DOJ for almost 25 years, um, and I've worked with in tribal issues for uh, the vast majority of that. And uh, one of the issues that has been of, of real interest to me over at OJJDP is how uh, state, local, and tribal juvenile justice systems can work together, especially um, tribal youth who end up in the uh, state or local juvenile justice systems. Um, I attended a conference back in must have been December, I think it was, in San Diego, where I heard a number of the speakers that we have today on uh, talking to their state partners and to other tribes about some unique situations that they have um, in their states for notification of tribes when they have um, youth who have been um, involved in the, the state or local juvenile justice system. And I thought that would be a topic that could be of interest to many states. Um, there are currently only three states, to the best of our knowledge, who are doing that. Uh, New Mexico was unable to join us today, but um, we have presenters today. Uh, our first presenters will be from Oregon and then from Oklahoma. So without further ado, I'd like to start with our Oregon panel um, and introductions. We have two speakers for our Oregon panel. Um, the first is Leslie Riggs, who is an enrolled member of the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde. Uh, for the past three years, he has served as the Tribal Liaison and Native American Programs Coordinator for the Oregon Youth Authority, also known as OYA. Uh, prior to this, he served as the Educational Division Manager for the Grand Ronde Tribe, and before that, he managed the tribe's vocational rehabilitation and employment and training programs. As an adult, Leslie learned his traditional language and taught in his tribe's language immersion program. Throughout his career, he has sought ways to serve the Native American community and has worked with numerous individuals who have experienced the justice system, and he has been an advocate for finding better ways to serve youth so they do not end up in that system. So Leslie will be one of our uh, two speakers from Oregon. Um, the second is Jacob Reed. Um, Jacob, we're happy to have you on as well. He's the mental health case manager for the Select Behavioral Health Program. He is a tribal member of Select and a tribal descendant of the Southern Oregon tribe Shasta, Kelma, Galice Creek, and European descendancy of Ireland, Germany, and Scotland. He spent the last six years in behavioral health, starting literally at the front desk um, and moving into the prevention and youth development coordinator, where he was able to connect um, with the youth that are in um, OYA, or the Oregon Youth Authority. He is a current student at Portland State University, um, getting his master's in social work. He is a committee member of the Indigenous Gardens Network, um, connecting tribal people with first foods and traditional homelands. He's a happy father of a three-year-old and a five-year-old and currently facilitates ropes courses, seeking safety, the Red Road to Variety, and cultural and outdoor activities. So welcome, Leslie and Jacob. I will turn the floor over to you. Hi, Masi Marsha. Lush Lachthan, Connery Matsaika, Leslie Riggs, Nikan Nim Pus Namunk, Nachila Mathkabuk, OIA. Slush Nagatumdum Pusna Mithlet Kanamox Kanawi Matsaiga. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Leslie Riggs, and um, it is my pleasure to be here uh, to present this information to you all today. And um, yeah, just looking forward to um, uh, to getting on with it. And um, so hopefully you'll find this informational and engaging. And um, let's see here. I have to move this line along. So there's our um, our uh, names and titles, which Marsha mentioned. Thank you very much for that. And then, so I'd like to get started with um, Oregon Youth Authority's vision and values. Um, our vision for the Youth Authority is that youth who leave OIA go on to lead productive and crime-free lives. And our values, our core values, provide the foundation for the decisions, actions, and practices that make up the agency's daily work. These core values guide and inform all that the agency staff do to protect public safety, reduce crime, hold youth accountable, and aid in the reformation and keep them safe. The core values that we adhere to are professionalism, accountability, integrity, and respect. 
I'd like to talk a little bit about how uh, we got here about the legislation uh, that describes our responsibility as an agency in respecting the sovereignty of the nine tribes in Oregon and establishing and maintaining relationships with them. The slide contains language from Executive Order 9630, which mandates the state develop processes in order to establish positive relationships with the tribes so we can do better business with, the, with them. Now, this slide contains language from Senate Bill 770, which passed in 2001. So, this bill is the main reason why positions such as mine exist in our state's government. Most state agencies in Oregon have tribal liaisons or at least designated staff who act as liaisons between the agencies and the tribes. The legis this legislation is also the blueprint for the policies that OIA has enacted that impact our notification procedures and other policies. The next slide discusses some of these policies. So the first policy deals with notification from the facility. The first step is recognizing that when we have Oregon tribal youth in our care, we must alert the tribe to that fact. The second step is making sure the tribal representatives have the opportunity to attend meetings for the youth as key decision makers in the youth's treatment. The second policy dictates our notification process, which is essentially my responsibility as the tribal liaison. Once I become aware of an Oregon tribal youth in our custody, I must contact the, tri uh, the tribe to let them know. Now, the third policy I included is our religious practices policy. This policy dictates that youth have the right to access religious services. In the case of Native American youth, this covers things like sweat lodge and smudging, among other activities that could be deemed to fall under this category. And beyond these policies, we have MOU's Memoranda of Understanding with seven of the nine tribes in Oregon. The MOUs are based on the policies and describe the responsibilities of the agency and those of the tribes. As for the two tribes we do not have MOUs with, we operate as if we do. So this slide discusses our notification processes. As you can see, it is the responsibility of the juvenile parole and probation officer and case coordinator to contact myself or our Native American services coordinator um, when they realize they have a, an enrolled Oregon tribal youth in our, in our custody. Then we have 30 days to alert the tribe. We try to connect with them as soon as possible, but this process is not perfect. And sometimes we find out later than later that we have an Oregon tribal youth in custody. In these cases, we contact the tribe to make our apologies and get the work started as soon as possible. Now, please let me know if I'm moving along too quickly and folks aren't having the opportunity to um, really glean from the slides. So this uh, slide discusses uh, when we notify uh, tribal partners. So the tribal liaison, myself, and our Native American Services Coordinator, we contact tribal representatives to let them know when we have one of their citizens in our care. We then alert them of any changes on the status of youth. For instance, if they change units, move to another facility, or to a step-down program in the community. We also alert tribal representatives of anything pertinent to the youth's condition while in our custody, such as self-harm, suicide attempts, uh, YARs, which are youth incident reports, uh, and other behavioral issues uh, with which the representatives may be able to assist the youth. We contact the tribes uh, before a youth is transitioning back into the community. This does a couple of things. It allows the tribe time to explore what kind of opportunities are available to the youth. It also provides the community time to prepare for the youth's return. We're not always aware of the kind of impact the youth had on the community. If if it was a major crime, the community will want to know that the youth is returning. And why we do it. So there are many reasons beyond policies for alerting tribes that we have their youth in our care. And I've listed some of them on this slide. So tribes often have resources available to their citizens that are only for enrolled tribal members. 
At times, youth can access these even while in close facilities. Oftentimes, youth are eligible to utilize these resources while on probation and parole. And creating and maintaining a connection with the youth's tribe provides them a positive outlet that has an impact on their identity and self-esteem. It can provide an alternative to other identities the youth may belong to, uh, for instance, gang affiliation. And at this point, it is mostly anecdotal, but we do see positive impact on the youth who attend our programs and events and connect with their tribes. We're working on finding a way to track data associated with youth involvement as we are a data-driven agency. Now I'm gonna hand it over to my co-presenter, Jacob, and uh, as uh, he, so he can talk about uh, the slide. Hey, uh, uh, thank you, Leslie. Yeah, so as you were, were going through, uh, thinking about, um, you know, obviously our tribe has a, has a, a great ton of resources, you know, um, but how do you actually access them, right? How do you build that connection to these things? And so much of, of even thinking about something like college or thinking about what work I want to do in the future, you know, thinking about, you know, how do I want to connect with cultural activities, language, and things like that is based on whether or not you feel a sense of belonging, feel a sense of connection, feel a sense of purpose, you know, within that community. So for a lot of the youth that, that we, you know, engage with, the reason why they ended up in OA in the first place, because they were severely disconnected, right, from the, from these kind of things. And they, you know, the, the only people they knew were, you know, involved in gangs or involved in kind of like these cycles of, of, of hurt that kind of keep going through. So so it, it's pretty powerful when we can build that relationship. And um, Leslie's been able to connect us with, uh, I don't know what the word is, MDT is basically, it's like a wraparound type of support where the youth is all like, hey, uh, these are my hopes, these are my dreams. And then we're like, okay, so here's some potential resources that we can that we can get going. So it helps to get that warm hand off. And then when they're out here, we already have that 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 trust. And, and so like, you know, we have people, I was able to go up and, I guess well, that's going to be the next slide, but uh, once they're out, we have the already the relationship enough to be like, hey, we could be your your connection out here. And um, in in the slide that that Leslie just just pushed to, there was an example. Of the the first week he was out, we went up and had coffee together. You know, just because for this youth particularly, there was like when they were going in, there was no there was nobody trying to encourage them to do things like work or school. Like there was just like it was a vacuum, right? Of, of you know just survival type of stuff so like they really needed uh, a community that was going to encourage them to to use the skills because they got a lot of skills while they were in there you know like uh, job trainings and things like that but if their whole environment around you is saying you know that doesn't matter right so we have to kind of uh, insert ourselves and you know be that connection to kind of keep those those good things going and um, keep giving them them hope So you want to talk about the process of uh, yeah sure yeah i was just going to say i mean a lot of what jacob is is saying is is really important because um one of the uh situations that we notice uh within uh, oregon youth authority is that we have a lot of youth that um, are really searching for something and uh, they don't necessarily have the kinds of supports that um they they need and um you know so it's it's especially important and and you know that's why you know we i feel this you know this webinar is so important about establishing those relationships especially with enrolled tribal youth um because uh, you know the, there are those services that are are that um can be provided but we do i want to make sure that it's clear that that um we don't only serve enrolled tribal youth um at Oregon Youth Authority the majority of the youth that is uh that is in our custody um they self identify as native american and so um that's good enough for us we're not asking anybody for uh, CDIB, we're not asking anybody to prove necessarily that they are a member of uh, a, a, a federally recognized tribe. Um, so, but any of a uh, number of our uh, programs and services that we offer, they're absolutely eligible to attend. And um, if they tell us that they're, um, they, you know, they're, you know, Cherokee or Choctaw or, or you know, um, Seminole or whatever, uh, we treat them as if they are. That's good enough for us. So I just want to make sure that we, uh, you know, we we talk about that. But um, 
so you know so i think uh, i think jacob's done a really good uh, job of talking about kind of the progression you know and, and this this like kind of illustrates that you know kind of how we we go through that process so i'm going to go ahead and let jacob unless you have anything else to add i'm going to go ahead and move us along great thank you for that so to conclude um Notifying tribes when we have their citizens in our care, it's the right thing to do. And partnering with tribes when we have their youth in our custody has proven to be effective. And as I stated, it might be anecdotal, but we see improvements in youth's outcomes when tribes get involved. And as an agency, it is our responsibility by law and policy that we work with tribes and having a good relationship with them helps. And keeping the best interest of the youth in, in mind uh, helps too. Uh, and when we work together, it increases the likelihood of success. Thanks so much, Leslie and Jacob. That's absolutely wonderful. Leslie's um, contact information is here on this slide, and we have some questions for you. Um, so for awesome. whoever Thanks. wants to, to uh, take these, um, one of our uh, audience members wants to know if there are any protocols around the inquiry and identification of tribal youth that you could share. Protocols around the, um, can you repeat that? Sorry, Marcia. Um, around the inquiry and identification of a tribal youth that you could share. How do you, how do you figure out um, who are your kids within the facility? Yeah, so that's, that's a really interesting question. And it's one of those things that, um, you know, we, uh, we, as I stated earlier, we're, we're not perfect at it. We have not perfected that yet. We, um, the, how it's supposed to work is that during intake, um, the JPPO or the case coordinator or whoever's dealing with that youth in the first place is supposed to, to ask the question, you know, how do you identify, you know, um, because we have any number of, of uh, marginalized youth within our, our custody. And, and so if they state, you know, I'm, I'm, I identify as Native American, well, then the next question should be, do you, are you enrolled in a federally recognized tribe? And um, if they say yes, then that then really our phones and our emails should be lighting up at that point, making sure that we know that we have those youth in our care. And then so, but sometimes, um, you know, it does happen that um, I just received a, an email the other day from a case coordinator alerting me to the fact that they had, we had a Maidu youth in our custody. And so I did some research to try and um, to hook that youth up with some some services there at at, um, uh, at their rancheria, and it turned out that that youth was not enrolled uh, with Maidu. I mean, had said too that his father was enrolled, and neither one of them were. So, so it, it, a lot of times we do have to do some digging. A lot of youth they're confused and they don't know what their situation is. And so, um, and, 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 you know, because of a lot of things too, you know, like, um, you know, a lot of tribes have different enrollment policies and those kinds of things. A lot of tribes have differing levels of blood quantum that they accept and those kinds of things as far as their citizenship is, is, is concerned. And so, you know, we, we basically, we just get, you know, we just stay curious and we ask questions. And um, so we, we reach out to family members. Um, so, because a lot of times, you know, the, the youth are just misinformed and um and so uh, we just want to do our best to make sure that if they are eligible for anything that we make sure that we get that for them i ho hope that answers the question i think i went a little bit outside of it but uh is that satisfactory what do you what do you do if a youth is not enrolled in a tribe in oregon how are you making that connection um, because I assume that you have uh, youth there who are enrolled in various different locations. So, yeah, I mean, so the Oregon uh, connection is easy because I've worked in Indian country in Oregon for nearly 20 years now. So I know a lot of people. And so that uh, is, is great. But, and as you know, Marsha, I've leaned on you a couple of times to help you um, get me in touch with folks. And that's been awesome because there were times where I was trying to reach out to different tribes and for whatever reason, probably my emails were going to spam. I don't know why the phone calls weren't being returned, but you know, um, it's uh, basically we just we just keep at it, you know. So if if uh, a, a for instance is um, the those Seminole youth that you helped me get in contact with some folks at Seminole, um, we uh, reached out, finally reached out to some folks there, got in touch with people, 
And um, it turned out that those youth were eligible for some COVID monies that they wouldn't have known about if we hadn't have done that. And so it's just a, you know, it's just one of those things where like once we know um, that a youth is enrolled in a tribe, whether it's Oregon or, or other national tribes, we just get busy doing that work because it's it's not something that we feel is um, just completely um, should be uh, bound to just Oregon tribes and feel like we, be, you know, diversity, uh, equity and inclusion is, is a major, um, you know, initiative with our agency and it's something that we take to heart. And uh, so if um, if if you know if uh, there are things that those youth should be getting, then we may want to make sure that they're getting that. Sounds good. Thank you. Another sure. question: Is there any collaboration with the tribe while the youth is actually in the facility? And it kind of goes along with another question of our tribes being able to come to the facility, um, engage in the MBTs, um, part of the monthly treatment programs or plans. Absolutely, and I mean, you know, Jacob, uh, feel free to jump in if you want to talk about your experience with that. Um, yeah, but, uh, yeah, go, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I think uh, both is true. So, like, we can get involved in the MDT. I remember the first time I went up to the OIAX, he was in person, and I was able to check out like the sweat lodge ceremony, you know, and get a feel for how the whole facility was run. It was really a welcoming space, you know, and a really challenging situation for this youth and. Um, but I also the MDTs are also super, super great because they don't, you know, sluts is pretty far from, you know, McLaren, a lot of these facilities. So being able to, you know, just, just zoom in and, you know, be present as we're trying to, to, to manage plans and also get a feel for like where they're at, right? Well, what's going on with the, you know, with their daily lives, what treatment are they going through? You know, it just helps in the planning because we do have, we got transitional housing. There's a lot of things that we could be thinking about and we can't really puzzled out until we actually know what's going on. So, so it definitely feels really, the whole process is pretty, pretty engaging. I think the, uh, it, it, you could, it helps later on when we start to transition out if we're, if we're there, you know, cause some of them, sometimes they're in there for like four or five years. Right. So yeah. just keeping that long-term relationship is really powerful. Yeah. And, and, and beyond that, you know, we have, we have other um, reps that do things like do monthly zoom calls with the youth. They provide cultural resources to the youth. They, um, they, uh, we have one individual who's a Klamath tribal member that actually holds Klamath specific sweats for just Klamath youth at one of our uh, facilities down in Southern Oregon. And, um, you know, so it's, um, so folks get invested in different ways. I didn't mention it and I should have, we have a Native American advisory committee to the agency that meets uh, quarterly. And at those meetings, we talk about all the things that we're doing. And then we talk about all the things that we should and could be doing. And um, so we're just always looking for ways to um, to better ourselves and to find ways to to better um, the outcomes for our youth and to make sure that we're providing them the resources that they need. That's amazing. Okay, uh, here's a question that I think I will go ahead and take uh, from a, one of our, our participants. Um, she said, I know we're hearing from Oklahoma and Oregon. Is this program available in other states? How do we find out I'm in Louisiana? Um, so what I would say to that is the only three states we know of that have some sort of this kind of program are New Mexico, Oregon, and Oklahoma, and they are all done differently. Um, Oregon's is literally a policy. It is not a state law that says you must do this, but they've incorporated it by policy in some of the other things that their state law says that they need to do. In New Mexico, there's an actual state law that requires the notification. So if you do not have one in your state, and I'm fairly certain Louisiana does not, um, you can start a grassroots movement in, in various assorted ways um, in terms of seeking to maybe have the legislature pass a specific law to that effect or work with the um, youth authority um, or your state's advisory group. Every state has an advisory group um, that helps govern their juvenile justice systems um, and talk to them about um, the, the possibility of getting a policy put into place. We've got a lot of state advisory group members on here um, and we're hoping that more states follow suit here. Um, we've got another question here. Um, what percentage of the youth adjudicated to the Oregon Youth Authority are either tribal members or self-identify? Uh, we generally hover around 11%. So right now that means that we're looking at um, probably about 120 youth and that number fluctuates. And, and uh, the interesting thing about that is that only about 16 of those right now are, are actually enrolled Oregon tribal members. So it's quite a low number, which is a good thing. And is that somewhat proportional to your state population or higher or lower? 
Well, it's 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 disproportionate to um, to our population. Uh, I I think Oregon. I don't know the hard number, but the the um, the folks that identify as Native American in Oregon, it, it's a pretty low number, somewhere around five percent or something like that. So it's definitely disproportionate to our population as far as um, the the number of uh, youth who identify as Native American being uh, incarcerated or in our custody. So yeah, definitely okay. would say. We also have one um, of our participants noting that they have a hard time getting their probation department to ask about tribal affiliation or um, uh, enrollment. Um, so that's something obviously to think about. Um, and then an interesting question um, that's a little bit different. Does the family have an opportunity to withhold Oregon Youth Authority to tribal notification? There might be several reasons to withhold that notification, including harm to the family reputation, funds and services received by family or guardians or possible restrictions from the tribe. Absolutely. Yeah, families um, are and are key members of, of um, the MDTs, the multidisciplinary team meetings. Um, we have a family engagement. Um, we hold family engagement meetings. And so absolutely families can weigh in on uh, however they would like. And um, so, uh, Fortunately, at this point, that's not been an issue, but if it were, then we would definitely follow suit. Okay, sounds good. We'll take one more question for our Oregon panelists, and then we will also get to questions um, and use some of these with our uh, Oklahoma panelists also at the end. Um, and we do have a participant who wants to know, what about assistance for children of state recognized tribes, not federally recognized tribes? So in Oregon, that's not an issue. We don't have any state recognized tribes uh, here. Uh, we only have the nine federally recognized. And so, um, yeah, that wouldn't be a, an issue for us. Okay. And if a youth discloses later, like not when they come in or they don't maybe have enough blood quantum to actually um, meet uh, enrollment standards, is that a problem? Well, no, I mean, so that's something that we actually assist with. So if, if, if a youth um, is, is they feel that they're enrollable, and this is when we start those conversations with them, their case coordinators and their family, and we get everybody involved who can help us kind of put that uh, information together. And then, so we'll help them get their um, birth certificates. We'll help them get, you know, other kinds of documents that they're going to need for those enrollment applications. And so, no, I mean, and, and a lot of times, you know, like I said, a lot of youth, they don't necessarily have all the information. And so it really is kind of born of the, of just of the conversations that we have with them, you know, so, um, uh, it, because I know of a couple of instances where, you know, youth didn't, um, could have, were trying to enroll in, in one tribe, but then when we got involved, it turned out that they were, they really should have been enrolling in another tribe. And so then we got, you know, got involved in that, helped them with the application process, and then they eventually ended up getting enrolled. So, but that's definitely something our office assists with. Was this with sounds Excuse good. Me. And it sounds like you have somebody from Oregon on here as well, because they note that OYA has a female facility that also has the same processes. Um, yes. Seven OYA facilities with one being a female facility. So this is not specific to male youth. That's correct, yes. Cool. Um, and then quickly, can you speak to any data or systems coordination with the state of Oregon's Child Protective Services, Title IV E or ICWA teams? Uh, well, so we definitely um, uh, are, are, are aware of those, um, those uh, situations. Uh, ICWA doesn't apply to, um, to our youth because the youth are in our custody. And right. so, um, but we definitely, um, we, yeah, we don't get in anybody's way. I mean, obviously, if, you know, if there are, uh, we also have like in, in Oregon, we have a couple of tribes that are non PL 280 tribes. And so, um, so they generally handle their own, you know, issues. And so, um, but yeah, no, we just, we just do our best to partner as, as best we can. Sounds good. Um, and as Leslie noted, the um, Indian Child Welfare Act does not apply to juvenile delinquency proceedings. It does, however, apply to state status offense proceedings. So if states um, have uh, youth court proceedings in which um, there is a st underlying status offense, uh, which is an offense that by virtue of the fact that the person is underage makes it an offense, like a curfew or an alcohol violation or something like that, the Indian Child Welfare Act does apply to those and tribal notification is required under ICWA. 
Um, okay, so thank you so much, Leslie and Jacob. We'll keep you around for questions at the end, um, and we will move to our Oklahoma panel. So for thank Oklahoma, so we have, and you bet, thank you. Uh, for Oklahoma, we have uh, first up um, two of our state folks and then two of our tribal folks. Um, so Laura Broyles is um, on our panel today. She served the state of Oklahoma as the Title II Juvenile Justice Specialist since 2017. She has over 23 years of experience working with juvenile justice stakeholders to improve outcomes for youth and especially minority youth. She began her career in juvenile justice, providing intake, probation, and aftercare services to youth in rural Oklahoma. In 2002, she became Oklahoma's first probation and aftercare services to youth in rural Oklahoma. She became the uh, disproportionate minority coordinator and then later the acting racial and ethnic disparity coordinator. In 2021, um, Laura became the director of the Office of Standards for Prevention and System Improvement, which is a division within their Office of Juvenile Affairs responsible for overseeing small and large scale prevention projects funded with state or federal dollars. As the state juvenile justice specialist and director for the Office of Standards, Laura works with state leadership, including the Oklahoma State Advisory Group, the state racial and ethnic disparity coordinator, the state tribal uh, liaison, and the state compliance monitor to implement plans designed to ensure the core mandates and critical components of the Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Act are embedded within the Oklahoma juvenile justice system. Laura is married with two daughters, one son-in-law, two grandsons, and two Australian shepherds. Our other state presenter today is Carrie Cox. Carrie has an associate's and bachelor's degree in criminal justice, as well as a teaching certification in elementary education um, and self-contained history from the University of Texas at Tyler. Um, she has worked for um, OJA since 1998, spent the first seven years at the Central Oklahoma Juvenile Center, which was a medium security facility. In 2005, she transferred to the field and went to work for the Seminole County Juvenile Services. She is an intake worker as one of, also one of two probation or parole officers for her county. She has five grandchildren who are Seminole, Muskogee Creek, and Choctaw. So we'll start with the state folks and let them do their part of the presentation and then I'll introduce our two tribal presenters. Uh, so Kara and Carrie and Laura. Thank you. So um, this is um, a little bit about our tribal notification process here in the state of Oklahoma. So, oh, sorry about that, my slides jumped. Okay, let me get back to it. So um, in 2015, um, we partnered with our tribes and at that time, we had a state juvenile justice specialist who worked closely with um, our tribes to um, put into our Indian Child Welfare Act, Title 10A, um, Sections 2-2-101. Um, and if you actually, in the uh, materials that were sent out by email to you, this is a hyperlink, so you'll be able to go to that um, link and look at it in the body of the law. Um, but this allows us to, um, or requires us to notify um, the tribes anytime there's any um, lineage that um, ties a young person that's referred to us to um, an Indian tribe or nation. I mean, that really make, helps us make sure that that young person is connected um, to their tribe. And so this today, we're gonna to talk a little bit about with you about what we do in Oklahoma to make sure that that notification occurs. So in Oklahoma, we have 77 counties. And within those 77 counties, our state agency divides those up by seven districts. And all 77 counties have what we call a juvenile services unit worker. Um, in the juvenile justice system, some people consider those probation officers. We've really tried as we become a hope-centered agency, um, have really tried, work hard to change that language. Um, we are um, case workers, we are, have intake workers, um, we, but, but if you're thinking of it as a juvenile justice system, those are probation officers, um, but we think of them as case workers. So there are seven districts. And each one of those offices, um, when a young person that has Native ancestry and they identify that way, um, then there's gonna be notification laws to tied to that young person with um, Native ancestry. So one of the things to think about is that the statute that we looked at our um, internal policy actually mirrors that statute exactly. 
guidance because we want to make sure that our staff are doing exactly what statute says to do. We also use um, an internal tribal nation notification directory that we update regularly. And we have a state level tribal liaison who works directly with local tribal liaisons within our juvenile justice system. So all three of those things occur so that we can make sure that that is being communicated and that is being delivered. And one of the other things that I think I would also add to this, um, and, you know, one of the things I love about these webinars is that, you know, as our presenters from Oregon were presenting, my wheels were turning and I was getting excited because I thought, we've got the law and the legislation in place, but we really need to expand on it as a state. And so I was getting excited about how we could even further develop what we're doing as a state. Um, and so those tribal liaisons are there and our state tribal liaison is there, but wow, what we could do to continue to build as we build our infrastructure as a hope centered agency. So I hope that when we look at this a year from now, this, this slide will be filled up even more with our procedures. Um, and maybe we can get some of that from our Oregon um, friends as they clearly have built up their, their procedures. So here is our agency policy, and I really wanted you to have this in case you're trying to build that within your agency and so that you can see how we took that directly from that legislation. Now, this is our internal document that we use and that our workers are going to fill out and they're going to identify the county. They're going to place the address in there. They're going to indicate where that young person is at. They're going to put the tribe that they're affiliated with, the address, the city, all of that information. Um, and then they're going to forward that to now what you will see, what they will see on that notification directory um, is the contact information who that um, Indian child welfare worker is, and then they will directly get that to that, that particular worker, and then they will forward this document to them. Um, now I'm gonna forward this on to Carrie. Carrie, would you like to take it from here? Sure. Um, McGurg has changed how we do things in Indian country. Uh, if our officers call with the youth that is native, that report does not go to us. It goes to the tribe in which uh, the county that he has the offense. Um, it's been well over a year since I have received any kind of report on a native youth. Uh, our DA sends them on to the Seminole Nation for them to do them. Um, the only time we've received now a report that has a native youth in it is if there's a non-native counterpart, we still do our non-native children. They come in for regular intake and we go from there. Uh, one of the problems that we're working, not problems, but one of the things we're working to resolve is when we have both native and non-natives, we do not always know the outcome of the native youth. And it, that's a, it's we're a work in progress. McGarry is a work in progress. Um, I think, though, for our Native youth, it, it is awesome and it's working well for them because they're getting the services that they feel they need rather than um, feeling like they're just on the side. And I'm proud of where Oklahoma is moving with our Native youth and with our policies. Um, we notify if by chance we get a youth and for an intake and then we find out that they are Native. Uh, we stop our intake. We take our reports to our district attorneys. They transfer them on over to the tribal. And we also send a notification to the use tribe then and there, even though we're not dealing with intake anymore, so that they know that they have a youth that may be in need of services. Um, something else I would just kind of add um, to what Carrie is talking about prior to McGirt is that I took a look just at caseload numbers to kind of give you an idea. So we were looking at referral numbers maybe 10 years ago um, at over 3,500 um, Native American youth, and we are now down to back in 2022 at um, 1,200. 
So it's it's a significant difference for us as a statewide agency. Um, and so learning to adjust to that and then learning to make sure that we are still being culturally sensitive um, to the native youth that we do have come in contact with the juvenile justice system. Um, and as, as we were talking, as we were listening to Oregon, I think one of the things that we need to do as a state um, is make sure that our state advisory group is continually engaged in that process. And something that we've done really well that I am very proud of is we do have um, native representation on our state advisory group. And um, we have native grants that will be going out for tribal youth programs. And within those grants, there is a requirement for youth advisory councils that include native youth on those. And so if we can make sure that we're always embedding um, native youth voice and then pulling in those opportunities that can also include system involved youth and credible messengers, and we're including the tribes in those processes, I think we can strengthen that process. Um, and then again, taking some of the things that we've learned from Oregon um, and other states that are doing this, this well, um, I think Oklahoma can continue to strengthen and work with our partners better. So um, that's all that we have. Um, if you have any questions, please um, feel free to reach out to us. Thank you so much to both Laura and Carrie. I do have two questions that have come in and we're asking you to stay around for questions at the end as well. Uh, the first question is uh, from the map that you put up, like who, um, the questioner is wondering who made the district? Who decided where the lines were drawn? So that's an internal agency decision that was decided on by um, the director at the time and a deputy director over all of our field offices. So it's, a, it's an executive team decision between the agency director um, and I believe the agency board and the deputy director of that division. Okay, and when did your law go into effect requiring, requiring tribal notification? It was November 1st of 20, I believe it was 2015. Okay, and then uh, one of our participants wants to know, is it a state law that tribes take over jurisdiction for offenses committed by Native American youth? It, it is if it occurs in Indian um, land, so in Native American land. So if it's on in, in Indian country, then it's going to stay within their jurisdiction because that is sovereign land. If it if it occurs in tribal, I mean non-tribal land, then it's going to stay within district court jurisdiction. Okay, sounds good. Thank you, Laura and Carrie. Um, I'm going to turn to our next two tribal presenters from Oklahoma and introduce them. Um, next, we have Patty Buell, who is the director of juvenile justice from the Cherokee Nation. Patty is a lifelong Tahlequah resident and a proud citizen of the Cherokee Nation. She is a former chief of police um, and director of public safety from which she retired in 2020 after 26 years in law enforcement. She is also the former missing and murdered persons coordinator, the MMIT coordinator for all three United States attorney districts in Oklahoma. Leslie and I had the pleasure of working with her in that capacity recently. Uh, Patty has both a bachelor's and a master's degree from Northeastern State University and a Juris Doctor from Mitchell and Hamline School of Law. Um, so Patty will be one of our presenters. Um, and our second presenter uh, from um, a tribal perspective is Amanda Swope, who is a descendant of the Osage Nation and a citizen of the Muscogee Nation, where she is employed as the Director of Tribal Juvenile Justice. After receiving her undergraduate degree in psychology from Northeastern State University, Amanda began her career in nonprofit management as a development director, fundraising and grant writing for um, social service organizations. In 2018, after receiving her master's of public administration from the University of Oklahoma, she started working at the Muscogee Nation as a self-governance analyst, negotiating federal compacts and identifying areas of sovereignty expansion. Amanda has worked locally in her community on political campaigns since 2010 and brings with her research experience and policy and data analysis. She has served on multiple diversity, equity and inclusion committees um, and police advisory councils, as well as volunteered with organizations like the Community Service Council, Junior League of Tulsa, the Tulsa Young Professionals, uh, the Little Blue House and the Terrence Crutcher Foundation. Her passion for civic engagement led her to serve as the youngest and first Indigenous Chair of the Tulsa County Democratic Party. And in November of 2022, she was elected to the 59th Legislature of Oklahoma's House of Representatives. 
Today, she remains employed with her tribe and committed to reimagining the future of justice in Oklahoma and in Indian country. And we're lucky to have her today because the legislature is still in session. So Patty and Amanda, we'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Marcia. And I would like to start by commending you for pronouncing Tahlequah correctly. That never happens. Um, Osio, as Marcia mentioned, my name is Patty Buell, and I'm the Director of Juvenile Justice for the Cherokee Nation. I appreciate, I appreciate and am excited about the opportunity to discuss the Cherokee Nation Department of Juvenile Justice's experience with tribal notification in Oklahoma with you today. Um, you've seen this slide previously from our colleagues at OJA, um, but while federal law requires that states notify tribes when a tribal member child becomes involved in the child welfare system, it's not a federal requirement that states notify the tribe about youth that are involved in the justice system. Fortunately, Oklahoma state statute does require tribal notification in these circumstances. So you might be asking, why is that important? I think you've probably heard a lot of reasons today why that's important, but tribal youth are twice as likely to become involved in the justice system as their non-native peers. And this coupled with untreated intergenerational trauma, addiction, and other challenges specific to our population highlight the importance of services for our youth that are culturally informed and tradition-based. So I would like to quickly provide some context as it relates to the Department of Juvenile Justice and our involvement with, tribal, with the tribal notification process. Um, I know that our colleagues at OJA already mentioned the McGirt decision, so many of you may be familiar with that, um, but that's specifically applicable to the Muscogee Nations Reservation, and uh, my colleague Amanda will discuss that a little bit later. This decision, um, the decision that affirmed the Cherokee Nation Reservation had never been disestablished was the Hogner decision, so that was, that was our decision. Following Hogner in March of 21, our Department of Juvenile Justice was created to address the rehabilitation of youth involved with, our ju with the justice system. Previously, all uh, Oklahoma Office of Juvenile Affairs notifications were provided to um, our Human Services Department at the Cherokee Nation. Once our office was established, Human Services began sharing the notifications with our department, and this allows us to collaborate with Human Services and other intertribal departments, as well as um, stakeholders outside the tribe with respect to resources and services to assist our youth and their families. And I realize I'm a fast talker, so if anybody has a question, please feel free to to pipe in. Um, our goal, this, this slide shows our mission and vision, um, and our goal as it relates to notification is to determine what services the tribe might be able to provide to the youth and their families as part of the rehabilitative process, which is, of course, our goal. Um, providing culturally relevant service to, services to our tribal youth is vital and integral piece of ensuring that our youth are supported and successfully reintegrated into their tribal communities. Services that our tribe may provide are varied and may include cultural activities such as traditional games or language classes, healing wellness programs, educational opportunities, traditional life skills programming, and so on. Our tribe has very robust uh, resources for tribal members. The picture that you see on the screen here um, is a stickball game that we organized, our office organized for some of our youth. We also coordinated with other departments and community members and elders for our youth to learn other traditional activities such as marbles and cornstalk shoot. Some of our youth are learning to make their own stickball sticks, bows, as well as getting the opportunity to learn more about their language and culture. This provides the opportunity for these youth to reconnect with not only their community, but also with their family members who are also encouraged to participate in these activities. We've seen incredible outcomes as a result of providing these resources to our native youth. Our tribal youth and their families are not only citizens of the tribe, they're also citizens of the state of Oklahoma. So it's important that we work together to ensure that all youth in our state are being supported in the most comprehensive and appropriate manner possible. Tribal notification is an integral piece of this process. And while tribal notification has provided a vehicle for the tribe to provide culturally relevant services to our tribal youth and their families, we've experienced some challenges. And I believe Laura mentioned sort of, um, sort of tangentially some of those challenges earlier about how we can more robustly, um, you know, maybe with policies and, and collaboration work on some of these things. But I'll just discuss a couple of those now. Um, First, the state statute doesn't provide clear guidance on how it relates to how comprehensive the notification process cooperation and information should be. 
For example, the state statute um, indicates OJA will notify within three days of intake the tribe of which the child is a member or citizen. However, our tribal code indicates that a child falls under our jurisdiction if they are a member of a federally recognized tribe or eligible to become a member. So in other words, if a child is not a tribal member, but their parent is, and the child is eligible to become a member, then by our code, they are subject to our jurisdiction. If, if the um, offense occurs within our reservation, of course. This does not directly mirror the state's code, and as a result, there are discrepancies between the two with respect to who has jurisdiction and what services they may receive. And this can result in confusion and duplication of effort. Um, I learned something today um, when Laura mentioned the fact, or I, maybe it was Carrie that mentioned the fact that uh, if they determine that a, a juvenile is in fact, a tribal member, it's forwarded on to the district attorney. And I don't know if that's just specific to, to Seminole County or if that's everywhere, but um, we do receive those tribal notifications, but we most of the time don't receive anything further. In other words, and, and in fact, I'm getting ready to talk about that right now. Um, second, because of the vagueness of the state statute, there may be confusion related to what information, if any, can be provided to us. The last line of the state statute indicates that the information related to the juvenile matter shall not be disclosed. In order for us to provide relevant services to youth and their families in their specific situation, it's important that we receive details related to the offense or offenses committed other, and other detailed information. Currently, when we receive a notification, we only get the barest of demographic information, but no details related to the offense, where, when it occurred, what agency handled the matter, and so on. And um, Laura shared with with you the letter that we received. Now, some counties have a different format, um, but again, it's it's very basic and, um, you know, having that information would allow us to direct the family to the appropriate resources for the specific issues they're facing. And oftentimes we're not able to get that information. So, but all that being said, while there are challenges related to notification, the notification statute is a, a positive step towards working together in ways that serve our tribal youth and the families in a culturally relevant manner. We'll continue to work collaboratively, collaboratively with our partners to find ways to best serve our Native youth. And um, we look forward to working with our partners on that. So now I will turn the floor over to my colleague from the Muscogee Nation, Director of Tribal Juvenile Justice, Amanda Swoop. Wado. Thank you, Patty. Um, and I just want to say thank you so much for having me here today. I've enjoyed um, hearing all the questions from the attendees, too. There's been some really great questions going on there. Um, well, I'll just kind of pick up where she left off. Um, obviously, our case at Muscogee Nation was the McGirt case, which is, um, I would say, the biggest topic of conversation whenever we talk about um, uh, the sovereignty of tribal nations and the process of, of bringing juvenile justice youth back into our custody and and working with them through that. Um, so to give you kind of an overall picture of what things looked like for us before, um, it was very similar to Cherokee's process. Our juvenile justice and any cases that we did receive notification on were going through our human services department, our children and family administrative services. Um, and prior to McGirt happening, we actually had only had three cases that we had been working at the time. Uh, post McGirt, we closed out the end of the year last year of FY22 with 395 cases. So it's definitely um, increased our caseload in a very exponential way. Um, and following that, we took a lot of steps um, to build up our program. Uh, we had one caseworker prior to, to me getting hired as the director. Um, and we were fortunate that uh, she was someone that had been also an employee of OJA for multiple years. So she had already had a lot of experience about what programming looked like there um, and worked really dilig diligently to build up our program as well, um, as far as the process and, and forms and different assessments and things like that that we do. Um, so having that wealth of knowledge was very helpful for us. Um, and we also took steps to work with the University of Las Vegas Law School to start building up our juvenile justice code. Uh, prior to McGirt, it had been uh, put under our ICW code. And so we really had to break that out and, and start uh, developing language, not just for our jurisdiction in cases, uh, but just what our process was gonna be like. Um, similar to what Patty had said about Cherokee as well, 
our language about um, what kids would fall under our jurisdiction is a little bit more broad, I think, than the state. Um, and another way that we're actually different, um, unfortunately, is that the Muscogee Nation doesn't offer uh, doesn't recognize uh, freedmen descendants. So that's kind of an area of complication that we still deal with as well, um, because a, a lot of local counties that work with us know that we don't recognize freedmen. So if an individual um, is identified as a, a freedman descendant, um, their case isn't transferred in the same way that a, a federally recognized tribal youth would be transferred to us. Um, so a couple of distinctions there. There is a, a case going on internally for us right now that might change the dynamic of that going forward. Um, and we'll address that when that happens. Uh, but right now it's really federally recognized youth that um, have been encountered within our jurisdiction. And then Patty, if you wanna skip to the next slide. Um, this was just kind of a little bit of a rundown of what all our program does. One of the main reasons that we worked to move tribal juvenile justice out from under children and family is because we really are this program that touches all of these areas. Um, we work with our court system, we work with our prosecutor's office, we work with law enforcement and investigators, uh, we work with the state agency, OJA, um, and we work with also counties. Um, and so, and then at times we also even work with our ICW division whenever there is cases that are overlapping. Um, one thing that I try to make clear to people is that we're we're not a response unit. Um, you know, we're the people that do the supervising after the fact. We work to make recommendations to our prosecutor's office on what we think would be best for the youth and the family, um, and get them connected to different diversion programs and and work with them through that community supervision. Um, anywhere from I would say with most cases six months to a year. Um, and so, yeah, we're really, we consider it to be a caseworker and, and community supervision as opposed to maybe what some people would consider to be probation or parole. Um, and then you can also go to the next slide, Patty, if you'd like. Um, so some of the things that I think, um, uh, I'll just kind of break out some of the challenges and benefits um, that I've seen in, in my time at the department. Um, Overall, I would say that our, our relationship with uh, with the state and, and with local counties is good. We have a contract actually with a, a county detention facility uh, that works really hard um, to, to build community with us as a tribal nation. Uh, but there are some counties that that are more willing to work with us than others. We do still have the state law for notification uh, that requires OJA whenever they get notified. Uh, to notify us, but there are some counties that have, um, I would say, taken it upon themselves to feel the need to try to go ahead and send the case to the federal government and, and just bypass the tribe altogether, uh, which in a lot of instances, we're in a place where uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office is not taking our cases unless they are ones that happen to be um, typical, uh, very violent or, or egregious in, things, in ways like that. Um, you know, if it's lower level stuff, it usually ends up being something that gets sent back to the tribe. Um, and so that's kind of one small area that we've run into. I would I would agree with uh, Patty and Laura that uh, there could probably be some more done also to back up to the, the state law of notification to make sure that that's a comprehensive process. Um, not so much anymore, but whenever we were first uh, making adjustments due to McGirt, there were a couple of times where uh, you know, we would have to be kind of advocating for kids in our custody, well, that should have been in our custody, uh, to get the cases transferred from from either counties that were reluctant um, or things like that. Um, and so, really, just kind of continuing to build that up and make sure that it um, it backs up to tribal codes as well. Um, let's see. Uh, because of McGirt and kind of the accommodations that we've had to make because of it, I think we end up in the same place um, like a lot of the other tribes here in Oklahoma. Uh, we don't quite have the same access to, to bed availability and things like that that the state does. Um, while, while Laura and um, Carrie are great people to work for, unfortunately, there's still a lot of leadership on our state government uh, that has not allowed um, certain agreements and things like that to take place that make it challenging for us to have access to those resources. 
Um, so we've really had to look at the private sector whenever it comes to where we send kids that are needing um, treatment and things of that nature. Um, and I'm surprised that that hasn't come up yet through any of the other um, panelists, but we do have um, cross deputization agreements with a number of the counties that we work with um, that allow uh, county and, and city law enforcement to um, apprehend tribal youth or any tribal individual that they come across uh, that's committed a crime. Um, and so that gives them a lot of leeway to be helping us with our cases and things like that. But it also sometimes presents the problem of of us having to train them on what our process is. Um, you know, they've uh, they're very aware and uh, familiar with what the process is for the county or the city that they work for. Uh, but it requires a lot of training and education to get them on on board and understanding what our process is as a tribal nation and how that can look a little bit different. Um, not a bad thing. It's just, um, you know, an obstacle that we've been having to, to deal with since McGirt happened. Um, some benefits that I would say uh, that we've gotten from McGirt happening is there are um, certain times where tribes take a more restorative justice approach than the county governments or, or the state um, in relation to how we handle these cases. Um, and, and that's not to knock anybody. There's definitely things that they have the availability to do better than we do. Um, but it's just, I think, identifying that there's resource gaps for everybody and that we need to all work together to kind of connect those. Um, but one thing that I've seen be a real benefit of of the McGirt ruling and, and giving tribes the ability to um, work more with this youth is that a lot of them, this is unfortunately their first interaction with their tribal nation. Um, and, you know, I hate that it has to be through a scope of juvenile justice, um, but that is the case sometimes. And so it's really getting us um, the opportunity as a nation to get connected with youth and families that maybe weren't as connected to us prior to that. Um, and get them either resources that we know are available for them or to just start getting them um, more familiar with their culture uh, and getting them, you know, more uh, wrapped into our community in a way that uh, it would have been nice for them to have that opportunity from the very beginning. Um, and then also another thing that I just appreciate about it is I think that it um, is always going to be something that strengthens our sovereignty as a nation. Um, I'm sure that it's not unknown to anybody on this call that, um, you know, the success of our nations really does lie with our youth. And so being able to have that connection and, and be able to make that with a young person before they hit the age of 18 and start making them familiar and engaged in the culture um, is, is just going to be something that kind of helps us even more in the long run. And I think that's my last slide. Um, I tried to touch on everything, but... <laughs> Well, thank you both so much to Amanda and Patty. And of course, we have some questions for you. Um, but first, a comment from one of our participants who had to sign off a little bit early. She works out of the Fond du Lac Tribal Social Services Department. And she noted that um, she, in her role, works with Native youth who are lodged at the local juvenile detention facility. Um, and she is able to provide services um, while the youth is in custody. And upon release, she can provide services within their service area. She noted that she works closely with the staff at the detention facility, courts, probation officers, prosecution staff, uh, and education facilities as well. So it looks like um, in Minnesota, they're doing some of this work on a kind of a more of a social service, but voluntary basis. Um, we had one pallet or one of our participants want to know, uh, this is kind of the, I think, a Laura question. What happens if a tribe is in two different districts in terms of notification, like say the Ponca tribe, um, how is that handled? If they're going to be in two different districts, we're going to make sure that um, that they're notified based on where they identify. So if they if their lineage, how they identify is how we're, who we're going to notify. So if they're if they identify as Ponca, then we're going to notify the Ponca tribe. Um, so it's really going to be based on where their lineage is and how they're identifying. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. Uh, another question, does, does Oklahoma have an MOU or policy or an administrative requirement that directs local juvenile detention facilities to notify when a tribal youth is picked up and work with tribal probation or community supervision or restorative justice programming? 
So it sounds like it wouldn't be the detention facilities requirement to notify, but it would be um, the juvenile justice agency themselves who's involved wh where is where the notification would come from. Is that correct? Yes, the notification would occur prior to them being uh, placed at a detention facility per state law. Okay. And I, I can add to that also and say that even if, um, you know, by some uh, incident that a kid was detained and it wasn't known immediately that they were native, um, most detention facilities, at least even the ones we work with, use the JOLT system, which is the state online tracking system. And so they're, they would be able to become aware of that and then also take steps to notify as well. Sounds good. Um... Maybe more of a comment than a question. Um, there seems to be a gap in ongoing collaboration between state and local juvenile detention centers and tribes. It seems very basic to collaborate with tribal programs, familiar youth and family history, and there may be intergenerational information about case management, medical, mental health, behavioral health services that have already been utilized and possible current medication counseling or therapeutic services by the tribe to the family and the youth. So it sounds like this is a, an advocation for kind of like a, a wraparound um, service to be able to collaborate on uh, things that are already in place. Yeah, and, and I can't then, remember, Laura, do you, is there anybody from the state, you know, that participates in the MDTs that we do? I know at one point we had federal actors, but I wasn't sure if we had somebody from you all as well. I don't know, Carrie, are you familiar um, through your tribal liaison work? Is that something that you all discuss and have participated in? All right, hit the wrong button. Uh, no, we don't. I don't know that we do, Amanda, but I do think that that's something that, you know, and that's what I think was really impressive to me when I was listening to Oregon, that we definitely could improve upon is working together to wrap around those native youth um, it, just even to improve their outcomes and reentry when they go as far as custody into our system um, we could do much better on that so i appreciate that comment yeah uh question does oklahoma have gaps or barriers to youth with behavioral health or substance use disorder treatment facilities that will not accept ihs funding or insurance Um, I haven't seen any, uh, I will say that most of the kids that we've had, and that we've had to take steps to put through, um, treatment facilities have also actually had, um, the state insurance, which is sooner care here. And most of those facilities accept sooner care that we work with. And so, even if it were a situation where they didn't have IHS insurance or funding, uh, they would be able to access state insurance that is accepted by facilities. That's been our experience as well. Okay, and one of our um, uh, panelists noted that they attended a conference where some youth and tribal citizens had to leave the reservation to get an assessment, but then IHS would not cover the cost and the federal HIPAA policy made the results unavailable to the tribe. So potentially some issues there. We haven't really experienced that. We actually, um, if we require assessments, um, we actually, if they can't get it through the tribe, we actually pay for those assessments as part of our program. So we really haven't had that issue to date. Yeah. <laughs> Same here with okay. Muskogee. We either have our behavioral health department do it, or if they're not, if they don't have a certification for one, we'll pay for it at an external agency. And that should really even just be, um, a, a process of uh, release, you know, that the that the parent um, could sign for. Sounds good. Thank you. Uh, question: How would notification to tribes work for a native child that is duly enrolled? I would think it would work the same way it would any other way. Is you make sure that all the notification occurs. You make sure all the releases are signed and then everybody works together. Okay. Uh, another question, have you experienced many youth who are unaware which tribe they are enrolled in or potentially eligible to be enrolled in? And that's kind of for any of you. 
Oregon or Oklahoma. I have. Prior to McGirt, we'd have kids come in and we would ask, okay, what tribe are you? And they'd say, I don't know. You have to ask my mama. We don't do anything with the tribe. And that's the things that okay. we're trying to help them change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, same here in Oregon. Uh, we experienced that quite a bit. One of the things Amanda mentioned earlier that I think is really important is this. This has been a great opportunity. We also have had youth that um, have come onto our caseload that really didn't have a connection with their tribe, with the tribe or their culture. And this has been an excellent opportunity um, for them to learn more about their tribe and their culture. And it's really, they, it's, we've had really great outcomes with respect to that. Yeah, I haven't run into very many instances, um, but yeah, th there is, there has been a situation like Patty mentioned where um, they haven't quite gotten enrolled with the tribe yet, but their parent is an enrolled member or, uh, or yeah, the kids just not aware. They know that there's some type of native, but they haven't focused really on what tribe it is yet. It sounds like for all of you, it's not a deal breaker if there isn't that initial notification, as long as somewhere along the line, um, there is some information to, to you that you can follow up on. Definitely. Yeah, and one, one okay. thing that, that can complicate things too here in Oregon is that a lot of our tribes have um, policies that um, uh, you uh, here in Oregon, you can only be enrolled in one tribe here in Oregon. And um, a lot of times if you want to move tribes, some of them have policies that you have to relinquish your, <clears throat> your enrollment status for up to five years uh, in, in order to enroll in, uh, in other tribes. And so, but we do have situations where um, some families are split and um, so some youth are enrollable um, because of certain amendments to constitute tribal constitutions and that, and that can get kind of com uh, complicated because then say, for instance, a brother is enrollable and then uh, his, his, you know, his brother or sister is not, you know, so, um, and, and we've experienced that. Uh, with some youth uh, within the agency that um, that thought that they should be enrollable, but because of different parentage and those kinds of things, we just have to do that research. We've had similar circumstances because we also have a similar um, code that if they relinquish, they can't re-enroll for a certain number of years and they're not eligible for enrollment. So, you know, in that case, they're not eligible for services and that's part of, you know, that's part of the Part of what the code says is they're not eligible for services um, while they're not eligible for enrollment. So we also have a similar policy. I'm not sure if we have one that uh, notates a time frame for when you can't be enrolled again, but I know we definitely don't allow dual enrollment. And so there's definitely sometimes a choice among people to unenroll and enroll with their other tribe. Got it. Uh, one kind of follow up question from one of our participants wanted to know if, if blood degree or blood, blood quantum matters. And I guess I would just generally note that that is completely up to each individual tribe of the 574 federally recognized tribes. Each one depends um, on what their own decides their own um, enrollment qualifications. And so that would be a it depends uh, kind of question. Um, and then a note from Alaska. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I'm so sorry. I thought you were done. Um, I will say that we have had, and, and I've had to educate my staff on this, and I actually made like a little guide because we do have so many tribes, you know, specifically in Oklahoma, and they all have different, uh, well, not all, but most of them have different rules as it relates to, um, you know, blood quantum, whether or not that's a requirement. And um, for example, the Kiowa tribe, you have to be a quarter. And so if we have a youth say that, uh, you know, commits an offense, comes to us and say they have a parent that's a quarter, but they're an eighth, and they're not eligible for enrollment. And under that circumstance by our code that we would not have jurisdiction over that youth because of that, because they would not be eligible for enrollment, um, you know, in a federally recognized tribe. So that is, that is something that I've had to educate my staff on and, and can get confusing for people um but it is it is so it does matter sometimes for sure yeah and we don't have any blood quantum requirements um at, at least as far as eligibility for our program 
we would honor what other tribes acknowledge in their policy and whether or not that qualifies uh, a person for citizenship enrollment. And then we do run into the issue, like I kind of mentioned earlier, as far as um, some tribes recognizing freedmen and, and us not being quite there yet um, and, and the complications we have with that sometimes. Exactly. All of, all of our tribes here are, um, have different blood quantum requirements in that, and and <clears throat> actually some of them are, are actually lower lowering those blood quantum requirements because their um, their uh, their roles are sh are shrinking. You know, they're eff effectively going to blood quantum themselves out of uh, existence, and so a lot of our tribes here in Oregon are looking at those um, those policies and, and making changes to them. And one of the comments in uh, from also one of our participants is that Alaska has 229 federally recognized tribes and it's a consistent challenge there because Alaska does not have a state notification requirement um, and Alaska is also a public law 280 state. Uh, so the vast majority of um, Alaska youth will end up in the Alaska state system and the federally recognized tribes do not know uh, necessarily when that's occurring. So that would be um, a state in which it might be somewhat of a challenge just because of the number of tribes, but could make a huge impact both in Alaska and in California, um, public law 280 states to, to really implement something like what you both have done here. So we're getting down towards the end of, um, of our time with you today. Um, we've had a really robust audience um, questions, lots of participants. Um, just so thankful that all of you took the time to be able to come today and talk about this from both a, a legislative perspective um, in terms of having a, a state law that you follow, but also a policy um, perspective where you don't necessarily have to have a state law uh, in place in order to do this. And so for those um, folks out there from a state who are who have, you know, a lot of native youth and are interested in doing uh, something like this or have a federally recognized tribal presence, we would suggest that you contact uh, Leslie, uh, Carrie, Laura, uh, Patty, Amanda, um, Jacob had to hop off. He had uh, to go assist an elder with a, a matter that needed to be done right away. Um, but so from, from the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, just thank you all so much, first for the work that you do um, and the care that you take with our youth and also for working together to, to really try and um, help the youth with that tribal connection. Again, culture is prevention. Um, it's kind of the point of our series here, you are the, the kickoff uh, uh, webinar for our series.